The North Andover Board of Health are meeting on Thursday, July 26, 2018, and I call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have uh, a public hearing listed, but before we do that, I have a great pleasure to introduce our new Board of Health member, uh, Daphne Elva Lefleur. And Daphne is down here at the end. And I'm going to put Daphne on the spot to tell us a little about yourself, a little about your background, and uh, what brought you to the Board of Health uh, now. Hi, how are you guys? Um, thank you for having me. Um, pretty much, I, I'm, a, I'm a resident of North Andover, so I wanted to get involved in the town that I reside in. My background is in the healthcare um, sector. I work for Tufts Health Plan as a business development manager. And I'm doing a lot of philanthropy work and also in several boards. And um, so I wanted to pretty much be able to give back in the community that I work in and to learn more. And I'm here just to learn and also to get involved more in the town. Great, thank you, you did great. You did. I couldn't talk my first time as a, a board member 15 years ago. I could. It was just nerve-wracking, that's all. And you did great. You did great. Thank you. Um, we have next a uh, public hearing on the agenda. So what I'm going to do is uh, wait for a motion to open the public hearing. So I need a motion to open up the public hearing. Make a motion to open the public hearing. I need a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Public hearing is now open. Brian, could you give us uh, some information as to what uh, we're going to be doing next? Um, well, the applicant, uh, the uh, person that was issued the order, has requested a continuance. They need time to get their ducks in a row. They did send a representative here tonight, who I will turn it over to, and he can give you guys a quick little rundown, and then maybe request a continuance, and we'll move on from there. Thank you. Could you please state your, your name? Sure. Your, if, are you an attorney? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> such, a, the, such a great I, suit. I, I know. It's every so often, right? So uh, my name's Tommy Orr. I'm one of the associates at Johnson Bornstein. I support Don Bornstein. He asked me to cover for tonight. I do have a letter for, for the board. Uh, he did send it over to town council as well, just requesting a continuance to the next available date, which my understanding is in September. Um, so I can... Yep. you can like submit it. that right here to uh, Tony Forrest. Thank you. So just to give you a brief little rundown, um, the town started doing comprehensive inspections at Royal Crest um, this past uh, fall. We started getting everything lined up. There were some issues. There's a lot of housing complaints out there. So there was housing issues, building issues, fire department issues. So the town set up comprehensive inspections with all the departments going out building by building and unit by unit. One of the units that we found out there had some mold issues. So um, we ended up issuing an order letter through the comprehensive inspection team to fix all of these different things. Um, Royal Crest went ahead and they did remediate the issues in this particular building. Um, we did determine that one of the underlying causes of the mold can be, and it's probably due to a water table issue um, water table comes up, it comes up to the subfloor, and then causes issues within the unit. There are some other things wrong in the unit as well, um, but that's been taken care of for the actual unit itself. This is a building-wide order letter that was sent to Royal Crest that they're appealing. So they got to get their stuff all lined up. They want to come back. They do want to uh, potentially even meet in-house uh, over the course of the next month, month and a half, to try to straighten some of these things out. So. Are there any units in there that are not habitable due to the moisture issue? Not right now, no. That's my understanding. Okay. Yeah, the, the abatement of the unit that was in question was taken care of. The building does have a history of other units being affected in the past. Those have been, they have been cited in the past for this exact issue in other units. Um, right now with the water table where it is now and the drier conditions, there are no current issues but the building does have a problem that has been chronic. So that's why we want to try to sit down and try to figure it out. Seems like something that can be amicably agreed to. So agreed. Be I think between that's two parties, sure. Absolutely. I think that's why uh, uh, everyone's trying to work together to schedule some of those meetings. And 
really, you know, some of the, because our clients are from out of state, having some different folk, folks kind of fly in and kind of do all the due diligence in terms of making sure that they're prepared for that meeting and everything so that it can be productive. Um, I think that continuance is, yeah. I mean, it, it works for everyone. Every, everyone benefits there. Because uh, uh, you do and, and the owners do and the people that run the facility, as we do, want to make sure it's habitable and comfortable for its uh, residents. Okay. So is that it? I would recommend continuing until the next available Board of Health meeting. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to say or? No. Just that. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> I need a, a motion to continue the meeting till the, our September Board of Health. Um, a motion for continuance? To continue till the, til the next September Board of Health meeting. I second. As okay. Mm -hmm. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is passed unanimous. Thanks Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you very, very much. So now what we're going to do is close the public hearing because that issue has gone before us and has passed. So I need a motion to uh, close the public hearing. I need a second. I second that motion to close the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Public hearing is now closed. Okay. Approval of the minutes. Joe? The Ben Critique look good, ready to sign. Okay. Need a motion for approval of the minutes? Motion for approval of minutes. A second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 It's unanimous. The motion is passed. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if everyone got a chance to see the uh, Nor North Andover subdivision regulation, uh, the request from the planning board uh, for us to uh, discuss a couple areas in there. Um, I read it. Joe, did, did you have a chance to take a look at it? I did. Okay. And if you hadn't, we're, Brian's going to present it to us so that we're all on the same page on this. So Brian, could you just give us some uh, background on what, what uh, you, sure. they're looking to do? Yeah, whenever a subdivision plan comes before the planning board, they usually ask the other departments in town if anybody has any issues with the uh, proposal. If they do, they want something in writing, basically. So this is based off of the Mass General Law that I've given to you in your packets. And the Mass General Law has it listed out so that uh, boards of health or their authorized agents or appointees can submit something in writing to the planning board to either approve or deny. And then, obviously, if there's reasons for the denial, what those reasons are, so you can work with the applicant to hash those out. Um, the subdivision rules and regs for North Amber don't state, and I've actually attached the sections for you as well. This is in section 5.5.3. It says the Board of Health shall submit a written report to the board within 45 days after the plan is filed. So it doesn't quite mimic the state law, which says the Board of Health or an agent, authorized agent or appointee. So I just want to make sure that you guys understand that I have, if you want to, I can act on your behalf to issue something in writing to the planning board whenever a subdivision comes in on your behalf that either approve or deny the subdivision. Um, the only time we really get involved in subdivision planning is if there are septic systems on site. And what that basically means is before they can create the subdivision and divide up the land into different lots, you have to make sure those lots are viable. So uh, deep hole testing and park testing on each individual lot that they're proposing to make sure that a septic system can go on that lot and would meet Title V and be compliant with the state regs. So just a housekeeping issue, if you guys want to give me that authority, I will send a memo to the um, planning director, Gina Wright, saying that we voted and you gave me the authority to act on your behalf to approve or deny subdivisions based on <clears throat> this criteria that I've given to you in your packets. I'm trying to think, uh, it, within since you've been here, have have you acted? Has this come up as, as far as, yes. has there been a subdivision where? Mm -hmm. um, there are subdivisions that are proposed every now and then, okay. not as much as like a single family home, but they do come around. And the way it's always been, we've always given the planning board an email or a memo stating we have no criteria that would uh, against this particular uh, subdivision being proposed and they take that in writing via email and pass it on to the planning board as our approval but I just want to make it formal that you guys have voted to authorize me to do that for you. Would there be any advantage 
to you presenting it to us at a board meeting and discussing it, or is it basically the viability of their, if it's septic, their septic system, Correct. like you would normally do for a single family home mm -hmm. or two homes in, a, in an area and so forth? Right, that's exactly how it works right now. So the lots would have to come before us as a department to do the testing, make sure the soil is suitable for it, make sure they have the area and the size for it and can fit and meet all of the current Title Five setbacks. So it's mostly just individual septic plans once we determine that it can be done. It's housekeeping. Yes. I certainly wouldn't have a problem with, with, the, uh, with the director, you, uh, approving, um, but uh, I, I would like to first to go by the chair. Mm -hmm. just, to, just to call. Sure. And uh, the chair was a board. Yep. And sign, proof. Okay. The uh, Larry, comment? The, the only thing I thought of when I first read this was, is it something that the, uh, the board itself should discuss prior to giving their affirmation so that we have an understanding since we're the board? Or should we? That would be your discretion. Yeah. Um, I would say probably no, because um, although I have an understanding as an engineer, um, the real knowledge lies with Brian. Uh, and of course, some of us don't have that understanding at all. So, Brian, I'll speak with you. you can talk with Brian. You may want to bring it to the board, but you may not. Now, if I, it was a subdivision that had septic, then you guys would definitely hear about it. It would be a long, ongoing project. Um, the, typically, the subdivisions that we see have no septic, and we don't really have any oversight over any of the lot creation or placement of the homes and roadways and things like that. That goes to uh, mostly conservation and planning for stormwater, wetlands protection, and then lot sizes and placement. And no. DPW and engineering for water and sewer, things like that. Yeah, no, this would, this would be, again, like you approving uh, a new house yeah. that would be going up uh, their septic plan and working with the engineer and the uh, various peoples involved to have it installed and then uh, uh, inspecting it, okay. right? Yes. Okay. Is this something we need to vote on? Um, I don't have a problem. Just a discussion, or you can vote on it if you, if you choose to. It's not really something that we have to vote on, but if you vote on it, um, I can send a memo to the planning director. Yeah. I would probably vote this way. It's okay. you know, yeah. giving you the okay to do that. Okay. Um, anyone else have any thought on it, Michelle or, or Daphne? No, but I agree. I think we should vote on it. Okay. Just to make it... Since they keep mentioning the Board of Health, Board of Health, Board of Health, right. yeah. we probably should just make it a formal okay. declaration, that's all. That would be my recommendation as well. So, uh, Joe, any more discussion? Uh, no, but I can uh, make the motion. Okay. Okay. Make a motion to approve uh, uh, for, for new subdivisions, uh, the septic system, uh, a compliant, a compliancy with state regulations, uh, given uh, Brian the authority to do that as the director of the Department of Health. Uh, with with input from uh, from the chair. Okay. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Further discussion on it? I would just say that if it does happen, maybe it should just be in the monthly report. That way, there's a nice okay. um, continuation of documentation like throughout the year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I don't think we need to amend that motion because the motion's separate then. Right. Just, no, that was just, just add it to the reports. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. No, that's a good idea. That's a good yeah. idea. We, we <clears throat> need to know. Uh, Joe, any, anything else? No. Okay. Um, then I'll call a vote. All, all those in favor with uh, Joe's motion? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Aye. Motion passed. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'm going to save my talk on uh, emphysema for last in case uh, we have another, uh, if uh, Frank's here, because I wanted uh, to tie into what Frank did. Uh, I'm going to give a little talk on emphysema and its relationship to tobacco, but I'm going to, if Frank's able to make it, then I want to tie it into what Frank went over with uh, addiction, tobacco, and vaping, and yeah. so forth. I think it'd be a nice tie-in. So I'm going to save that till last. So um, why don't we go to new business then? And uh, anything you want to do the uh, reports, or you want to save that for another area? Um, 
I'm okay with two in the reports now, if that's what you guys want. Actually, it's really not new business. So, uh, is there any new business anybody, anybody would like to present? No? Okay. Old business? Boy, this meeting's flying. It is. Okay, correspondence and newsletters. <laughs> Brian. Correspondence and newsletters? Well, you can... Uh, so under old business, then, you do the operational reports. How's that sound? Sure. I knew um, it was going to fit in there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, it was actually a pretty quick month uh, with the holiday and everything. Kind of squished in there. Um, did your typical meetings. We do have a, um, an issue with the state right now with one of our regional host agencies. So some of the stuff that I have in here is the um, 3B Coalition HMCC meetings. So the state is uh, withdrawing their funding from our host agency because of issues that they have with the host agency. We have a uh, quasi-governmental agency based out of Lawrence called the International Institute of Greater Lawrence. And it's a, an educational facility, and they also do other uh, grant-funded work that has been housing the entire region, Region 3, which is all of Northeast Massachusetts, for the past 15 years. But they're running into some financial trouble so the state has questions and is skeptical about their viability moving forward. So they were supposed to get a contract in June, June 30th, for their uh, one year, and the state is reneging on that. So we're looking for a new host agency to house all of the funds for the entire Region 3 public health coalitions, uh, health and medical coordinating coalitions, and things like that. So oh, wow. it's a lot of going on at the state level and with the funding piece of it right now that we've been trying to work out and trying to figure out for several weeks now. But the state decided as of three days ago to not issue them a contract. At first they were thinking about doing a six month contract and asked IIGL to get them all sorts of documentation, business planning, financial planning, things like that. And they didn't get the right information to them in time um, or didn't have the correct information they were looking for or it didn't meet their quality standards. So the host agency that's been housing regional funding for the past 15 years is not getting the next contract, and they're gonna be looking for a new one as of like today. Oh boy. So hiccup mm -hmm. at the state level and all that stuff, but it's been very fun. So conference calls and meetings and everything. Does that impact your ability to get the funds? Uh, for now, up, they anticipate they will be back up and running with a new host agent by September 1st. So there are some uh, regional positions that are paid for through this funding that comes from the federal government to the state and then to local public health and medical coalitions. Um, so some of our regional staff are on hiatus for a little while, which is unfortunate. And the state doesn't like to put people in those positions, but they were really concerned about the long-term viability of this organization. So. Oh boy. That's been going on. Oh, that's a mess. And then typical inspections, um, some housing inspections, some trash complaints, uh, camps, uh, Bathing Beach, we did that inspection this past month, um, working on the trash trucks with the police, some septic and some abandoned properties, and then your typical building permit applications, food inspection reports until the five reports coming in on a obviously regular basis. <clears throat> Um, we did, I did revise the body art practitioner application to reflect the changes that we installed at the June 28th meeting. So it just adds on the new criteria that are required for documentation. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, new criteria for semi-permanent makeup, permanent makeup, um, microblading, things like that are now included in the application for practitioners so they can check off what procedures they're doing and supply the documentation for training in those different fields. So that's been taken care of and we just got that up and sent out today. Very good. Yes. That was huge. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Um, Thanks to Joe for uh, working with you to help you out on that. Yes, absolutely. He did the, most of the work, not me. Got it goes he, to him he and he pushed me. He pushed me. Before you continue, I have a question for you. The mosquito control, I see yes. at Stevens Estate. Okay. Um, I haven't seen any reports come out on, on uh, not, I don't need weekly reports, but the board hasn't seen, I don't, any of us okay. seen. What's going on uh, with? Mosquito control? Yeah. Numbers are actually down this year. 
good. which is a really good thing. There's been only one, as far as I know, one positive mosquito uh, in Massachusetts so far that tested for West Nile. And Granted, it's before the peak of the season, and the numbers are down because of how hot it's been and how dry it's been up until this past week. So I'm sure the numbers are going to go back up, and then they'll start collecting more. And it's getting into that late season where the virus tends to become more active. So we're looking for an increase in numbers and potential hits <coughs> coming up within the next month. Uh, but as of now, it's been really low. Uh, the Stevens State did reach out and wanted to talk about potentially spraying their property. So I met with Mosquito Control on site, uh, Bill, M Bill Mahaffey, and I met with Stephen Foster up at the Stevens Estate. <laughs> took a look around, and they did uh, end up going out and sprayed. I believe and they might be spraying tonight, actually. So, yeah. So. Um, yeah, they're having some problems with their night functions over there. Yeah. The staff and the people were getting eaten, so. Oh. I've been reading uh, about mosquitoes, uh, associated diseases, and so forth. And uh, I was surprised that they have a preference for people that have type O blood. Now, Frank, the doctor, he may say that there isn't a type O blood, it's, it's false news. But nevertheless, I read that in several different articles, and I was, I was very surprised to find that out. Maybe it's false news, I don't know. I have not heard that before. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> Come on, Frank, plead ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know that. I know that whenever I'm out uh, like around dusk with my wife, they go after her and not me, but I don't think she's a type A. I mean, a type O, I think she's a type B. <laughs> okay, thanks, Joe. So, so when you, uh, since it's so low, will, will, you, will you be sending out the uh, reports uh, when the mosquito population uh, later on in August or mid-August and so forth? Mm -hmm. So I don't get weekly reports from them. I have to call and check in. Oh, you do? Um, okay. If there's a hit, they call me right away. But they don't send me numbers. I usually just kind of keep in contact with them, see what's going on. Okay. Um, but yeah, as of right now, the numbers have been about 20, 25% down this year. Okay. At least for us. Right. I don't know about every other town, um, but yeah, so far so good. On the trash trucks under inspections, was that uh, two trash trucks that were stopped for not having uh, proper uh, permits or what? No, I made two visits to um, TBI. Oh, okay, fine. All right. Because of permitting questions and issues. Because they hadn't submitted their permit applications yet, and they thought they did. So I met with him on two separate occasions to make sure that it got in. We okay? Yes. Good. Good. Okay. Please continue. Okay. And then um, general administration, customer service, things like that, um, septic approvals and denials, and there's the order letter for uh, Building 7. And then uh, I started looking at body art issues, uh, not issues, but uh, more research for establishments themselves to see what other towns do for criteria for the actual physical facilities to see if they're different from ours. So the future revision down the road, if there's anything that I see that I think works better, we can incorporate those additional best practices into our own regs. Have we had any more uh, uh, trucks stopped? Enforcement stops uh, since Not last uh, last month. Since meeting? last meeting, I think there have been three or four that have been pulled over so really? far. Yeah. Okay. And then a couple. Actually, the police um, officer Wilson did me a favor and stopped by Charles George Trucking, which is off of Holt Road as well, because they're one of the um, companies that hadn't been permitted yet. So he made a special visit and stopped in at the office and said, "Hey, just to let you know, you guys aren't permitted. We're talking to the Board of Health. We're going to start pulling people over. You may want to." apply for your permit application. Thank you, officer. They yep. pretty much give them a pass, the first stop. Uh, they, uh, Sometimes they do. If they're a newer company or they hadn't been in town before, then yes. But some of these companies have been around for a while, no. And we've reached out, and that's why I stopped by Holt Road uh, TV at twice. Um, it was uh, Jeff Thompson came in here and talked to the board. I went and talked to him to make sure that he can get his company done. And then um, Charles George as well. Good. Caroline. So um, I'm kind of slowing down in camps, which is good. Um, I was spending a lot of time on one particular camp that was new to the area, hadn't 
ever run a camp in Massachusetts yet um, that had to be officially regulated um, or go through the regulations. So um, I was spending a lot of time with them, and um, then last minute they actually canceled because they weren't really well prepared. They didn't have the staffing in place that kind of followed the regulations. And so, um, so I have one other inspection um, that got postponed till Monday, and then I'll be done with camps, which is good. Um, so just kind of managing calls, emails with them, um, immunizations, nothing really new other than s establishing the flu clinic dates for the senior center and senior housing. Um, they have put out a quarterly newsletter which goes out in August, so they were looking for dates um, for September, October, so I actually was already kind of working on those, so just finalizing those and trying to coordinate with the schools and trying to set up my, you know, what everything's gonna kind of look like. Um, blood pressure clinics continue with the senior center every other week and then throughout the senior housing I have various walk-ins, um, a few home visits, um, what else? We had the blood drive which was successful for the first one being at the senior center and then our plan is to run it in the fall and then again in the, uh, I think it's February or March. Um, what else? Have, have um, we had, excuse me, have we had any issues with camps as far as violations I mean nothing's come before us for a long time but had no so there's a few um, no uh, they've actually with the new regulations coming out they've actually really all the camps that are running have been really good about keeping up with and trying to keep up to the regulations there is one camp that kind of runs from out of state and um, they you know expressed their um, difficulty with Massachusetts I said every state we run in Massachusetts is the most difficult state and you know but they have actually you know kind of slowly caught up with what has needed been needed of them um, so not so far that that was the one camp that has been running here in Massachusetts but they changed their status from like day to residential so then they qualified as a camp and so they had to go through the regulations and so they just weren't it was kind of late in the game they weren't really realizing that they had to do X Y and Z and you know so they just couldn't pull it together in time for their camp to start you know we kind of allowed them a little extra time I was on the phone with them I was writing these lengthy emails kind of you know hold holding their hand throughout the whole process and then at the end of the day they just didn't have the staffing to kind of meet the requirements so so it was a smaller camp I think it was like 11 12 kids, something like that, so. Things have really improved. Um, years ago, on, on, by what the department is doing, the health department, because years ago, we used to have, every year, a, some, some camp, somebody come before us <clears throat> because of failing to do this or that and so forth, and uh, same violations, sometimes the same people, but things, mm -hmm. have, I think, have really improved in town. Uh, so nice job on that, because we haven't had people before us for a long time. I think a lot of the same camps have been running and so you know at least last year when I started um, a couple of them came and they were so prepared they had everything in place they knew what you know was expected of them and I think that is helpful if they've been you know continuing to run every year um, some of the newer camps I think it's a lot to take on so it becomes a little bit of an issue and um, and we'll help them through it however we can you know so there were a couple of new camps um, that came you know a little bit more organized and prepared and they ran and they were they did a great job so just great. kind of great um, communicable diseases has been really slow and um, just kind of wrapping up flu season all the expired flu vaccines got shipped out and um, kind of finalizing the fall flu vaccine orders so that's pretty much it thank you that's right <laughs> Kevin, uh, some people, certainly um, older people like me, um, my records of shots uh, leaves much to be desired in my life. And can you quickly go over the shots that people should be getting in the frequency flu, pneumonia, shingles, and so forth? Sure. So flu is every year. Um, Pneumonia vaccine, it kind of varies. So if you're younger than 65 and you say have a chronic medical condition, you are a smoker, you should be getting one of the pneumonia vaccines. There's two different ones out there. Um, and then once you turn 65, you are eligible to get the Prevnar 13 
and then you should be getting the Pneumovax 23 a year later, and then you should be good for life is what I understand, is that once you're 65 and you've had both vaccines, and someone can correct me on this if it's wrong, but I've, I've, some people are under the idea, oh, I get it every five years and that's when I get my booster, but my understanding is that once you've turned 65 and you've had both of the pneumonia vaccines, then you are good for life with your pneumonia vaccines. And what if you don't know if you've had both these vaccines? So that's I the mean, thing. there are some people like me right. that don't know. Right. So <laughs> with, um, so for me, sometimes with residents, I kind of do a little investigation for them. I check the Massachusetts immunization system online. I'll see if they're registered, because a lot of times if you give a vaccine, you, have, you should be logging it into that system. So that way, wherever they go, someone can kind of track, okay, they already had the flu vaccine, or oh, they already had shingles. Um, if they're not in there or registered, I might follow up their primary care and just kind of say, hey, did you, you know so-and-so get the pneumonia vaccine? And so sometimes those are, good ways and other times I, I don't have an idea and so I try to just go by what the resident tells me and I said okay you know do you remember getting anything in the last few years or not and then we kind of just start from you know the beginning. With well, suppose you get it twice and all you have to get it is once. Are there any side effects of getting the same shot? Spontaneous same combustion. <laughs> Spontaneous combustion. Thank same you. That. Thank you, Frank. If, you, can, if, you can leave any time. If by Joe way. just puff, then you know, then you know that he's got too much. <laughs> Um, not that I've seen in the literature, so that people have gotten, I mean, just like I said, so if you have a chronic condition and you've already taken the pneumonia vaccine before you were 65 and you're getting it again five years later and then again once you turn 65, then, you know, I don't, from what I see in the literature, I haven't seen any contraindications to getting it more than once. You might get a sore arm. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wouldn't combust. I think you're too moist. Yeah. Let us know if you get it twice. We'll watch you for side This size. is a private conversation, by the way. Right? <laughs> uh, what about shingles? Shingles is, um, they have a new vaccine out there um, that is for 50 and older, as opposed to the older vaccine that was 60 and older. So now the shingles vaccine, if you're 50 and older, you, you are eligible to get that. It's a two-dose series. So, um, and then once you get the two-dose series, you are good for life. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Frank sent out a really good article. I'm sure all of you read it. Um, I did on uh, new information on tick-borne illnesses. And uh, I didn't print it. I, I'm not, you know, it's nothing I'm going to prepare to go over too much. But I thought it was a great article. There was new information. For anybody who wants to know where it came from, it was in uh, today's New England Journal of Medicine. I get the email version a day early, or two, a couple of days early. Very nice. Yeah, so it was a couple, uh, two days ago. Yeah. I agree. It was fantastic. Scary. It is scary. <laughs> it, it is, is scary. scary. So thank you for that. And rather than scare the public, we, we will talk about this at a later yeah. date. It was a great article, and, and the people should should be you know aware of new information that we can help provide, because it's, it's um, in the article, it's growing exponentially now. Yes. Um, uh, the uh, uh, bacterial infections that ticks cause, and now viral too. So, again, I don't have the article in front of me, so I can't. Quote. Parasites, uh, viral, and bacterial. Yep. Yeah. I mean, th I think so that the gist of it was is that there's lots of new avenues for research. They're going to target the salivary proteins to actually give you a vaccine against the vector, then the uh, then the actual virus. There's too many things that these things transmit. So if they can kind of like inactivate the saliva as they're feeding, then I think that's the idea. It's not quite ready for prime time. So the, the, the last line in the article was is you still need to cover up, use DEET sprays, and make sure you do tick checks after you've been um, in places where ticks uh, are. So it doesn't really change it, but it does bring up a little bit of things about like where the research is going. I, I didn't know those things, and so I thought I'd share them with you. I was actually going to ask you, is it a, I'm not sure, but is that how like frontline works on pets? No, I don't know how frontline works. So That's what I thought I was. If it's going to go into your body and attack, not attack the tick, but keep the tick from biting you or not being able to. Right, like making it unpleasant for the tick to bite right. you, I guess. I thought um, frontline or advantage or advantage, frontline. Yeah. Because you put those on your dog's neck and it soaks into their fur and their skin. That's what I thought of. Yeah. Um, for people. It, well, it, I don't know if it's ivermectin that's on uh, with uh, Frontline, but I'm not sure. a lot of animals, like at the uh, the shelter that when I volunteer, uh, if they have a little 
crawling lice or so forth, yeah. they might give them a, a shot based on a, a milligram per kilogram body weight okay. of ivermectin or something else, and uh, uh, we've done that before, and, and it, it'll kill the parasites on you. It's not gonna prevent them from biting you. Mm -hmm. It will, if they're on you and the chemical has gone through the skin and the hair, uh, the fur, yeah. then uh, it, it, will, it will kill them, okay. and they'll fall off. Yeah, it was a great article. Yeah. Um, I have to admit, this is this is not something that I usually kind of contact, but I saw it, and I said, "This is this is some, exactly something that you guys should, uh, you know, should see." And uh, you know, I get uh, my subscription allows me to pass it freely. If I gave you a link, I don't know if you would be able to open it up. Gotcha. Um, it does it does get get re these articles I think get released after six months, but you know, it's okay. nice to have it timely. Yeah, um, I read that, and then I reread an article that we wrote like a month and a half ago. And we're, we're really close. <laughs> no, it's uh, all the same stuff, but not as technical and scientific and medical as that article. It was a little bit medical, but I thought it was uh, something that, you know, with a little bit of work, you could probably get through and, and yeah, have exactly. a very good understanding of it. I had actually um, had that article put in the folders last meeting. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if you guys saw it at all. It was on ticks and Lyme disease. Yep. I think it, yeah, I do remember seeing yeah. that. I reread that and I was like, oh yeah, we're, no, we were actually spot on. <laughs> um, I guess maybe we can even think about getting that out again on social media just to keep it fresh in people's minds after reading the stuff about Powassan and everything. More tick diseases. I mean, when you, when you reintroduce something, you know, repetition is good for information yeah. and knowledge. Yep. So when you keep reintroducing it more, and if uh, people weren't on the social media site and they see it, they may, and they never read it before, they may be, have a tendency to read it. Yeah, and it, to yeah. them, it's something brand new. Yeah. So repetition is good as far as information and knowledge. Right. Nothing wrong with it. I wanted to uh, uh, really just tie in a little to what Frank discussed when he talked about tobacco with Ron Beauregard and uh, vaping. And I came across, a, just going to share some information. I'm going to read some of it, and some I actually have up in my head too so I can quote but uh, I, w it's a, I thought very short but it's a very good article on uh, emphysema and uh, we've talked about uh, tobacco causing uh, various forms of oral cancer and lung cancer and so forth but and uh, various types of uh, constrictive diseases of the lungs but we haven't really mentioned it too much and uh, so I want to just give you a little information and, and jump in it's, you know more of a discussion I'm just I just didn't want to memorize two pages of uh, material. Um, so emphysema is a type of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, in, in case you've heard of that, which is, and I didn't know this was, the, it's the third leading cause of death in the United States behind, behind heart disease and cancer. Uh, I wasn't aware it was that prevalent as far as uh, uh, that death part. Uh, emphysema is caused by damage to the air sacs of the lungs, called alveoli, after long-term exposure to airborne irritants. Over time, the damaged alveoli weaken and rupture, creating a smaller lung surface area, consequently causing less oxygen to reach the bloodstream. You know, you breathe in, and again, this is for the TV audience, uh, you exchange carbon dioxide and various other gases and oxygen, you reoxygenate the blood through the lungs. Emphysema is a chronic condition that develops slowly and worsens over time. People with emphysema have significant trouble breathing, which can impact their work, ability to exercise, quality of sleep, and daily activities. So I, this may be too small. Is this too small to show? I'll do. Probably. Maybe not. So on your right, this is a lung. And the little dots here are the alveoli. And on the top are healthy alveoli. And the oxygen, and there's no constriction here. It's an open pathway. And the oxygen is allowed to exchange within the lung. And for the uh, COPD or emphysema or one of the other lung diseases, the alveoli have been damaged, so they're not, not functional anymore. So there's no ability for them to help exchange oxygen. So I just wanted to show that, if you can see it, what it looks like, that's all. Um, 
Smoking is the leading cause. The primary risk factor for emphysema is smoking. Although extended exposure to air pollution or chemical fumes, as well as a, a rare genetic deficiency, can also lead to the disease. 85% of all people with emphysema are current smokers or have smoked in the past. And I find that uh, startling. Um, the risk of developing emphysema increases with the number of years smoking and, of course, the amount of tobacco smoked. Uh, while cigarette smokers are at the highest risk, pipe and cigar smokers also have elevated risk of the disease, and people who don't smoke but live with somebody who does are still at a risk for having uh, various types of lung damage. And it's not just emphysema. There's other types of uh, damage. You could, uh, 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 asthma can be caused, an irritant, smoke's an irritant, smoking is an irritant. The symptoms of emphysema occur gradually and often go unnoticed for many years. Because of the damage to the lung tissue, persons with developing emphysema require more effort to breathe. So that is a sign for somebody out there listening. As a result, they tire sooner. So you could mistake it for something else if you're exercising, having a difficult time breathing, could be asthma and so forth, but it should give you the idea that maybe you should see a doctor and be checked out. This leads to shortness of breath with even minor exertion. Uh, people with emphysema also experience chronic cough, chest tightness, and wheezing. For long-term smokers, symptoms usually become noticeable, be noticeable between ages 45 and 60 years. Uh, so when you go to your doctor, they'll take a, a very detailed history as to when it occurred, how often it happens, and what symptoms you're having. Uh, the doctors can also perform pulmonary function tests. And these type of tests, um, they measure the, um, how well your lungs expand. They can uh, uh, check for inflammatory uh, areas there, uh, the uh, airflow, transfer of gases like oxygen in and out of the bloodstream. So, and they can also do uh, chest x-rays as part of their diagnostics, CAT scans. They can even, even a, a biopsy if needed. So there are many ways to detect what's going on. There is no cure to reverse the damage to lung tissue. So once the damage is done, it's done. That leads to emphysema. The primary goal of treatment is to slow the progression. And that's the important part. Relieve the symptoms and prevent complications of the disease. The most critical intervention for the treatment of emphysema is smoking cessation. So if somebody has the willpower or uh, needs help through therapy or any other means to stop smoking and they're at risk in this area, this is the number one way to reduce your side effects of this, uh, of emphysema or, this, or the uh, symptoms of it, is just to stop smoking. Medications are used to improve the symptoms of emphysema and to treat complications of infections. Bronchial dilators are inhalers that relieve shortness of breath and breathing problems by opening up the constricted airways. So asthmatics, another condition of uh, uh, bronchospasms within the lung, emphysema, anything that causes constriction, the idea, of a bronchial, uh, the idea of bronchial dilators is to relax the tissue to allow more air to flow and more oxygenation. Antibiotics are given if the patient has an experience of a bacterial infection, such as pneumonia or acute bronchitis. Complications and prognosis. The prognosis for those with emphysema depends upon the severity of the disease. There's various levels of emphysema, various stages. The symptoms and the presence of complications. Having emphysema can lead to complications of the lung and the heart. High blood pressure, enlargement of the heart, and potentially heart failure can result from the constant strain on the heart caused by the reduced oxygen, okay? People with COPD, carniac, uh, car, um, COPD are also at increased risk for infections during the cold and flu season. Lastly, difficulties in adjusting to the changes in health and lifestyle can lead to depression. So if you can't function, you can't, you're having a difficult time breathing and there's no corrective measures, you're sick and you need help and it can lead to uh, certain types of, of depression too. So I just wanted to bring that out. Um, uh, talking about emphysema, it's a type of the uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and there's other types of, of, of uh, medical conditions that are, go under that but uh, it is the third killer, third leading killer in the United States 
and uh, so I wanted to point that out and tie it into when Frank was talking about uh, tobacco. It's, it's, a, it's a major deal here. When I was young, I can recall, um, I didn't know an adult that did not smoke. Everyone was smoking, uh, certainly in my family, and uh, my maternal grandfather, he died from complications uh, from emphysema. Uh, and his children, <coughs> they were also smokers. My mother died uh, when I was 12 of cancer, uh, but she was a smoker, and uh, her brother died of emphysema. And it, and it continues. If someone smokes in the family, there does seem to be a correlation and a better chance that the children are going to smoke. So my uncle, who died of emphysema, as did his father, my uncle's children, all of them, all of them are heavy smokers. Their children that are teenagers are over, are over, all of them smoke. It's really buff. And this past week I was working in, uh, in Florida and I read uh, USA Today. Uh, and I always read what's happening in Massachusetts, and it says that the, uh, the state congress is, is very close to increasing the age uh, to purchase tobacco products from 18 to 21. Have you heard any more about that at all, uh, Brian? I have not. I know they've been working on it, and they've been talking about it for a long time. Luckily, there's got to be a good 80 or 90 communities in Massachusetts that have already done that. So as of, you know, we're a 21 community here as well. Um, and that's been the push by local boards of health throughout the state. Now the state's trying to do it for everybody that hasn't done it yet, and hopefully they can get that taken care of. But that's been on the books uh, for a while now. This has been a, a topic that has been ripening for a long time. And uh, I remember when we discussed moving to 21, uh, we talked about, well, why doesn't the state do it? And the state doesn't do it until it becomes politically possible for them to do it. So in a sense, us trying to be one of the earlier movers on this was to really create the conditions to allow exactly something like that to happen statewide. Um, the politicians don't take risks unless there are rewards. And they're not going to stick their necks out and take a lot of heat. Getting back to emphysema, uh, and uh, as I said, my, my grandfather, my uncle died of emphysema. And it was such a painful way to go. Every breath was uncomfortable. It's not painful. What an awful way to die. Yeah. And, and they didn't go like this. It was over a period of time. Yeah. Now you're slowly No joking. quality of life at all. None. Suffocating. Yeah. And I, I've talked to uh, some of the procedures they use, and I've talked to thoracic surgeons about this. Uh, they may do, if <clears throat> depending upon the size of the area affected, and they can tell the area affected, um, if it's large enough and it's causing too much irritation to the healthy cells, uh, they'll take out a portion of the lung, a lobectomy, they may do a partial of whatever size there is to remove uh, that uh, bad tissue to allow the healthy tissue to hopefully reoxygenate better. So, you know, basically for all the smokers out there, it's a slow death. Yeah. You're suffocating, basically, slowly suffocating. Yeah, public health has been making strides for years on reducing the smoking rate. Unfortunately, there's vaping and that's picking everything right back up. So that's a conundrum, but at least smoking has been on the decline for years. I know vaping is now pushing nicotine and tobacco use back up. So I think the 21 um, regulation change that was done here, as well as numerous towns across the state, including a lot of our neighbors right here, uh, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. And working with healthy communities and Ron Beauregard and Tobacco Control doing our compliance checks or stings, I think is definitely a way to keep that number going in the right direction. I was talking to a uh, young student uh, who was uh, telling me in high school that uh, the vaping is rampant, absolutely rampant in high school. And uh, it's all over. It's just it's very popular and uh, Frank you mentioned that last uh, couple meetings ago when yep. you and Ron gave the presentation. And Cheryl came and yep. spoke yep. on the school's behalf. We have the schools here too. Um, <clears throat> you know we've made a lot of progress in um, uh, smoking reduction and smoking really is a direct result of nicotine addiction and so um, the, the, the concern or the alarm is really is that uh, what you're going to do is undo all the all the good that's happened over the last 25, 30 years. 
So um, it requires constant vigilance. Yep. How long does it take, Frank, to be addicted? Oh, probably not that long. Some, you know, some people get addicted with the first dose. With nicotine? Um, substances in general. I mean, some people are genetically susceptible to substance use disorders. And uh, all substances, no matter what they do, they all kind of work on the reward center. And some of us are more sensitive to that being lit up than others. And, uh, uh, you know, all of us are susceptible to some degree. Um, so the, the idea is that don't use substances when you're at a vulnerable age when it's more likely to become addicted. That was kind of the theme of the uh, discussion. And uh, so we, we know, we know it's, it's proven that if you delay the first use, you make it less likely that somebody will become addicted. So delaying that first use, um, making sure that that first use occurs after the brain has developed and is less susceptible to addiction. Uh, and then just being out there, is, some people are just very genetically susceptible to becoming addic addicted. And they just need to kind of understand that, be aware of it, and not put themselves in the situation where they open themselves to that possibility. But, you know, it's, a, it's an acquired organic brain disease, addiction. That was kind of the, uh, the theme of the discussion. And it's interesting how we, we, we handle it. Um, uh, again, when I was younger, so many people that I knew uh, smoked. And I, I never did, uh, but I was all okay with it. Uh, when I got out of college, like flying on a business trip, people are smoking the plane. It didn't bother me at all. Now, if someone is, you know, even walking smoking far away, I can, I can, I'm sensitive to it. I, I don't like it at all. Well, it's also been, but years ago, it was, it was okay. It's been denormalized. That's actually another one of the public health strategies, yeah. is uh, the denormalization of smoking. When you have, uh, when you have a, you know, somebody, you come a long way, baby, and you, you've normalized smoking. There's nothing normal about smoking. And so one of the public health strategies was, was to make it less socially acceptable, denormalize it. And that's, that's kind of one of the things that, unfortunately, vaping has become cool. And so now you've you've kind of created a, you've created something that is um, working against denormalization. <clears throat> so people do what they're going to do. But maybe we can make fewer of them do it and have fewer problems. Anybody have anything else they'd like to present or talk about? Frank, I wonder if you could do me a favor. We have a volunteer in the room here. Would you mind introducing that person? <laughs> <laughs> we always introduce people that volunteer. Yes, we do. We, do. we always do. So we're, we're very fortunate this summer to have, um, well, first let me say the, the scope of the problem. The scope of the problem is, is that there's a lot of work to be done in the health department. Yes. And, and, and I happen to have a nose to recognize when there are solutions to problems. And so the solution to a lot of the work that needed to be done was to have a volunteer. Um, but the problem is, is we've had a problem keeping volunteers. So I knew that we would have a short-term opportunity to have a volunteer with somebody who had a lot of time on his hands. And so we invited, we invited Dan, who's uh, at the far corner of the table, uh, who happens to be my um, youngest and also eldest son, <laughs> and in need of being kept out of trouble. Uh, he's been uh, working um, with uh, Tony and the health department to make sure that uh, a lot of the things that uh, have been uh, less prioritized just because there's no time to do them are actually getting done. And so we, we hope that Dan is adding and that he's not being the typical summer damage that sometimes high school students can be. It's wonderful. So I, the report I'm getting is that is that he's not summer damage, he might actually be summer help, so. He's absolutely. But anyway, absolutely. Dan McMillan, take a big bow. All right. <laughs> hey, thanks, Dan. Well, that's all I have to present. If no one has anything right. else, uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second All those in favor to adjourn, say aye. 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 It's unanimous. This meeting is now adjourned.